and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about all of life through the prism of food. And this week I'm slowing right down for a meditation on cooking and eating in an everlasting meal. The cool thing, it's, this is so neat. Look what I can conjure just by, just by thinking this way, just by by trying this out, by trusting myself. It's kind of a reclamation project. Tamar Adler is a former chef at Chez Panisse with Alice Waters. She was Dan Barber's researcher and a contributing editor to American Vogue. The book, which first came out in 2011, has clear echoes of Tamar's hero, MFK Fisher, with its poetic message of resilience and personal power, and its gentle humour is particularly resonant in these challenging times. I asked her if she'd written an antidote to all those 15-minute meals that feed the time-poor narrative. I think, well, I think, yes, it is, except that I think that a lot of the cooking in my book can happen quite quickly. It's more that it has a long-term perspective on cooking, so that it's not um, that you're you're spending 15 minutes on the meal directly in front of you, and then it's over, and then you spend another 15 minutes the next time and another, and there's not any continuity between the meals. The idea is that maybe you spend, you know, 15 minutes each time, but that is sort of, sort of accumulative. So that, you know, in one of the periods, maybe you cook a chicken or roast squash or, um, or make some rice. And then every time you get hungry, you perform a small act of transformation. So it doesn't necessarily take longer than the 15 minute, uh, recipe that you find in the magazine or the, you know, five ingredient, you know, thing on the, on the website or in the newsletter. Um, but it, it's more sort of grounded and connected and more of more, the, the feeling is more of investing time than of spending time. Yeah. I mean, Alice Waters, who you worked for at Chez Panisse, and we'll talk a little bit about her later, she wrote in your introduction, how rare and wonderful it is to have a book grounded in instinct, promoting the reader to examine the world around him or herself differently, allowing cooking to become a continuous, integrative process from meal to meal. I mean, that's it, isn't it? It's about actually sort of making one thing and chopping off the top and the tail and maybe the the, the peel uh, of a vegetable or a fruit and thinking, what am I going to do with this later? Absolutely. And I think, yeah, I think that I, I hadn't read that in a while, but I liked that she used the word integrative because um, that is the idea, that it can be part of your life and that it's sort of symbiotic that cooking can be part of your life but also the more it's just part of it um the the easier and more affordable and more you know sustainable for whatever that that word still means um it is so it sort of goes hand in hand like a like any practice that the the more you practice it the um easier the very practice itself kind of becomes. Yeah, it, and it's a philosophy about cooking, which is very much what Alice Waters is all about. But it's also what Dan Barber's about. And you've worked for both of them. I mean, what an experience. How amazing. Tell us how it was to be nabbed first by Alice. No, you'd done the research for Dan by that time, hadn't you? Who came first, Dan or Alice? Dan came first. And that was a really um, just wonderful experience. I can't even believe it really happened. But there was a moment where um, my brother, who's also a chef, and my mom, who is the person who taught both me and my brother how to cook, um, when all three of us were working at Stone Barns um, with Dan. My brother was the head uh, line cook. He was cooking meat. And my mother was volunteering on the farm. And I was doing... um, agricultural research for Dan. And so it was this really funny kind of uh, full family immersion. Um, But it was great. And it happened because I was leaving my job as an editor at Harper's Magazine. And Dan had just written an opinion piece in the New York Times, which claimed that being on the shelf for too long, or being in in a bin for too long, could make vegetables lose their vitamins and their minerals. And a um, wonderful uh, American uh, professor of food food studies pointed out that they can't actually lose their minerals and that he had been, you know, wildly wrong in that one assertion. And so he was walking around the kitchen 
saying like, God, I wish there was just somebody who could like check me on this stuff and help do the research so I can do my advocacy. And my brother said, actually, my sister just left her job as an editor at Harper's, you know, maybe she could do it. And he and I had coffee. Um, and then he hired me. So I got to do research on like whether vegetables that sit on the supermarket shelf for too long, you know, lose vitamins and minerals and whatever else and about soil ecology. And I just had this crash course in, um, in agriculture and advocacy. It was great. I mean, with the leading chef in the world. I mean, he literally is one of the most influential guys in the world at the moment. But then you could say, and plenty of people do, that Alice Waters was the person who basically kind of created modern American cooking. He, she was the first person to really kind of instill the kind of the farmer's market philosophy back in the 1970s and influenced, I mean, thousands of people all over the world. These two people <laughs> you both worked for, that's that's a pretty good start in life, isn't it? But you're not a chef now. You don't work in a restaurant. Where are you with your cooking? I am frustrated that my six-year-old does not have as, as Catholic a palate as I would like him to have because I live in the most wonderful place for local food economy. I, I live in um, the Hudson Valley in New York, and I write about food. I just finished... Actually, my third book, which is coming out right after this beautiful British edition of my first book, um, and my third book is an encyclopedia of leftovers recipes. So it sort of takes the philosophy of cooking along a continuum to its absolute logical extreme and goes like, can you write a recipe for each of these things? Um, and I was just expressing frustration to my husband yesterday that... You know, I, I know exactly how to make cooking work really well inside of a household and how to use everything, all of everything and tops and tails and every seasonal product. And my son, you know, still just wants to eat cheese sandwiches for every meal. <laughs> Let's start drilling down into, into the book itself. It's been likened to MFK Fisher. You absolutely lay it on the line that MFK Fisher was a great influence of yours, in particular, How to Cook a Wolf, which was written in 1942 in, during the war. And this, you kind of say, is about, well, as she calls it, cooking defiantly. When this book first came out in 2011, we were in a very different state. Uh, you know, fast forward to 2022, what does cooking defiantly mean when we are on the edge of the Third World War, when the cost of living is making life impossible for so many people, where climate change is threatening our very existence? You know, where does cooking defiantly fit into that now? There are so many ways in which the book is more germane now than it was in 2011. I mean, it. I started writing it then, in I think 2008 or 2009, because we were in the middle of a recession, and I had left my job cooking, and I was really cooking exactly the way I describe in the book. And there was a period where I had stopped cooking at Chez Panisse, and I was starting to think about what I wanted to do next. And I was literally doing something I think I describe in the book, which is like I teaching a butchery class and then taking home the bone of a leg of lamb that I had taught people how to butcher and turning that into a few nights meals. And I was really doing the kind of like recession style cooking that um, MFK Fisher describes, which is, you know, depression, D World War II ration book cooking. Um, and now here we are a decade later. And once again, there, <laughs> it is extraordinarily expensive to live. And it is extraordinarily expensive to try to live well, well meaning um, responsibly and pleasurably, right? Like uh, to live frugally without doing horrible things to our soil and our workers and our planet um, and ourselves. And so there's, it, it almost feels like just like the metabolism of the world has quickened because of social media and because of, you know, everything happening so much more quickly and on such a larger, um, more, more visible global stage, it almost feels like the problems have gotten um, bigger. The same problems have grown. The climate 
uh, catastrophe is worse. We have to think even more about where our food comes from, and we have uh, less money <laughs> with which to do it, and less childcare, and schools are closing all the time because of you know a global pandemic, um, and so it it we are in a different place, but we're at a at, we're at a place even closer to what I was imagining when I wrote the book, which is how do we hold these things in our hands and in our minds at the same time? How do we say, okay, we want to, um, we don't want to exhaust the planet in our food choices, but also we can't kill ourselves trying to do this and we can't spend, you know, $10 per cantaloupe. Um, or I guess the codicil is we can't do that unless we have a way of using all of the cantaloupe, cantaloupe not being the best example. Let's go with beets. Um, you know, because beets, you really can't use all of cantaloupe skin. You can't. But um, so it's sort of like I just feel like we're on hyperdrive with with every, with every one of the problems that I was trying to address. Um, we are now kind of staring even greater versions of them in the face, uh, which makes it, you know, I'm glad that the book is coming out again now because I kind of want to shout it through a megaphone right now. Yeah. But it's very calming, and <laughs> that's the point of it. I mean, the solutions are very clear. They're, it's basically about leftovers. It's about using everything, uh, but both of which, you know, Dan Barber and Alice Waters have, have been telling us to do, think differently about the proportions of your protein to vegetables, for example, as Dan says, local seasonal, as Alice has been promoting since the 1970s, live like the Italians and the French, basically cook like your grandmother or your great grandmother just don't waste anything and cook laterally and inventively but you do it with this delicious thinking as well which is so calming your beautiful chapter titles are uh, very reminiscent of how to cook a wolf obviously and you say so and in one chapter called how to build a ship you say there are times when I can't bear to think about cooking food is what I love and how I communicate love and how I calm myself but sometimes without my knowing why it's drained of all that then cooking becomes just another of hunger's jagged edges I love that so I have ways to take hold of this thing and wrest it from the claws of resentment and settle it back among the things that are mine and i felt that that paragraph sums up the entire book. It absolutely spoke to me. You know, we have different moods around food, but it's in our power to take it and let it settle and use it to calm us again. And your writing is very soothing. Did it always feel that way when you were writing it? Uh, it never felt that way, but it was. it made me really happy to hear you read that, having written it so long ago, because I do, you know, I think that the the... But what I wanted to do with that book, what I want to do with my with my third book, really, um, is uh, is say this is within your power, right? The more you feel like this is yours, cooking is yours, you can be in charge, you can be in control, you don't need any of what they're trying to sell you. You have it already. Um, mm. The more, I mean, that's what's really calming, right? Feeling like it is your it, it is within your power. It is not something you need to contract out. There is no expertise you don't have. There's just what you have already. But I mean, of course, as with making anything, like writing anything, um, you know, no, I almost, I almost died trying to write that book. And I'm in the process of almost dying trying to make the third one um, inspiring and useful and calming. But I think that that's always the hope, right? That you... <laughs> You, you you put in all the effort and then you remove the vestiges of the effort and then what's left is what you were trying to make, which is a, a calming book that is empowering. I love the process of writing because it is about bringing together all the things that you talk about, you know, the romance of the traveller, the poetry of a writer, the common sense of, in, in your case, a, a grandmother or a grandmother figure. And you put all that in a melting pot and you come up with all this beauty. But there's this wonderful sort of trip of the imagination. You reference a lot of the places that you went to. Do people have to go to Venice and Liguria and Provence as, and Lao and Oaxaca and all the places that you can take yourself back to when you're, when you're writing yourself back there. 
Do you have to actually travel in this time of f- carbon footprints? I mean, we can't, right? Um, I say that having having actually gone on a on a trip to Italy for the first time in years and years and years in April, um, and feeling guilty because of all of the carbon I emitted, but also feeling so refreshed by having been out of my house that I had been in for for two years. Um, I think that we have to experience things outside of our our small circles and our silos. I don't think they have to involve cross-continental or oceanic travel. But certainly, you know, it's nothing that can't, because it's all culinary, it's nothing that can't be experienced by going to the pocket of that culinary um, culture that is closest to you, right? I mean... I was really lucky to to travel all over Asia and and live briefly in Bangkok when I was 21. If I if I just went to Queens um in New York, I could eat you know the same things. If I could go there and get into the state of mind which is just open and curious, um I could have almost the same exact culinary experiences. I think part of it is that when you travel, you're so open. You're just listening, right? You're seeing, you're listening, you're not anywhere else. You are where you are. So I think it, it's not a question of geographic distance as much as kind of mental and spiritual distance. And if you can create that distance and then just go to your, you know, nearest Chinatown um, or, you know, the nearest yeah. food truck stand where they make the amazing tacos and amazing all of that, you know, you can have, you can, you can have as transportive an experience without, uh, without, emitting all of the carbon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can take those experiences that are so precious from whenever and conjure it up through your food at any time. I mean, that's the whole point of it, isn't it? We're, we have such wonderful access to ingredients from all over the world. We could just keep bringing it back again and again in our own homes. Yeah, and I think that that comes again back to the idea of it being within your power, right? Like the cool thing, the thing that matters is not traveling far. It's going, I can... This is so neat. Look what I can conjure just by, um, just by thinking this way, just by by trying this out, by trusting myself, by you know all of this. It's kind of a reclamation project, which is absolutely essential. When even though you sometimes think it would, you'd go in the opposite direction. When things get uneasy um, and tumultuous, actually, kind of reclaiming um, self sufficiency is really, really important. Because, you know, like if the power goes out, it's really important that you know how to cook something over fire or you are not actually reliant on the the gadget that like needs to be plugged in to work. Like if you don't know how long it takes rice to cook, you're in trouble, you know, if you yeah. if, if power goes out. And so like yeah. it's all this stuff totally. where I think it's I think taking taking that back um, is just is kind of the larger mission and it's available to everybody that's just like a really small you know mental a small powerful mental shift it is and uh, resilience is a fantastically creative aspiration isn't it i mean it's very commonsensical but you know it's it's ultimately about creativity which brings us to your first food moment which is about boiling i mean you know i imagine the kind of people who are going to come to your book are going to be great cooks and they're going to love food and love everything that you're talking about but actually you start with how to boil tell us why you chose this as your first food moment i i i, I mean to be completely frank i love boiled food <laughs> but the but the qualifier is it has to be properly boiled and i think that sort of that kind of gets at the essence of all cooking right i boiling is the simplest thing it is completely elemental it is really biblical in that it just starts with water you know it's like there's a flood it's this like it's it's how you how you begin or begin again um, is a big pot of water, but the water has to be really, it has to be big. It has to be really boiling, not before boiling, um, and not too little of it. And it has to be properly seasoned. And once you have deliciously seasoned boiling water, there's really nothing you can't do. And the more specific you get about the boiling water, the more you can do. And I, I, you know, I feel that I just was rereading, um, the book in preparation for this conversation, and I realized that I I gave the example of 
the most stigmatized boiled dinner as the British boiled dinner. And I, I, now that seems quite audacious of me because I'm sure there are other boiled dinners that are just as stigmatized <laughs> as the British one. Um, I apologize for that to your entire country. Um, but, uh, you know, my point was like, boiled meat is incredible, but it can't actually boil. And like, so the more that the specifics of that are, it, the meat has to be seasoned, the water has to be seasoned, and it really needs to be at below even a bubble, you know, almost completely calm surface. And there are some things that need a really, really fast, hearty boil. And some things like the best boiled potatoes are like the best boiled meat, not actually boiled. Um, and I certainly don't boil my boiled eggs. I bring them to a boil and then shut off the heat completely. And so all of this happens inside of, you know, this elemental pot of water. And there are there's a specific set of circumstances and, and prescriptions for each um, for each kind of end product, but it's all happening in this one totally basic thing where all it costs you is your focus and your attention. Like, so that's why I love, I mean, other than the fact that I really do love bolito misto and like any boiled pot au feu, any boiled meal is always what I choose. Um, poached chicken, there's the Vietnamese chicken and rice, all of it. Um, but all of them are examples of like so much care being paid to this pot of water. And I love that. Yeah. And it's, as you say, it's incredibly simple. And it's a reminder that you don't really need anything, which leads us very nicely onto your second food moment, which uh, is called How to Paint Without Brushes. This is chapter five. And um, I pulled this quote out of here. You say, a meal is cooked by the mind, heart and hands of the cook not by her pots and pans. And you're a crusader against cooking gadgets. A lot of people listening to this are going to go, oh my God, what about my gadgets? Tell me why you hate gadgets, sir. I'm sorry. I don't, I know, I, sh I don't want to make anybody feel bad about their gadgets. I think that the important thing, as with kind of my larger philosophy, is if it feels good to you and you really feel good about it, not you feel good because somebody told you to get it, not you got it out of like fear and anxiety because cooking wasn't working otherwise. And so now you're going to try this one last thing. But if you just, if you just love it, like I, when I wrote the book, I had a rice cooker and I just loved my rice cooker. And I went, okay, I'm going to, I'm really committed to this. I just want to pay attention to how it cooks my rice so that if the power goes out or if my rice cooker gets broken or if somebody, you know, takes it out of my house, as often happens to me with things because our doors are always open, I still know how to cook rice. Um, I think that's the, the, really how I, how I feel about it is that as long as the knowledge and expertise resides in you, anything that you kind of outsource it to is fine. But a friend recently came to visit me and my son in a in a very very rudimentary um, cabin we were renting on a summer vacation, and they they had brought um, chicken thighs and then they they confessed to me that they had actually never cooked meat other than in their sous vide machine, and they were feeling really nervous about what to do without their sous vide machine. And so we you know we talked through chicken thighs and we cooked them really simply over a fire. Um, we talked about kind of what a sous vide machine does and then what fire does. And I, I'm only kind of against them in that they can take power and knowledge away from the cook who buys them. And I want yeah. the power and knowledge to reside inside of the cook so that you don't get mistaken and think that it's the Instapot that's doing it. Instapot is just slow cooking, right? So you, you need to know how to slow cook. And if you understand what the Instapot is doing, then by all means... You know, you can cuddle your Instapot every night, but understand what it's doing so that if somebody takes your Instapot, because you yeah. always leave your door, kitchen door open and people like to take your cooking things, um, you can still make the same dish. It's the same thing. It's just building this layer of skills so that you can set yourself free, so that you are truly resilient. It's, it's a brilliant, brilliant chapter, as is uh, your third food moment, um, a chapter called uh, which is about fixing mistakes, and it's called How to Snatch Victory from the Jaws of Defeat, which is great. I mean, it's just so incredibly useful. It's about how to fix things when they go wrong. I mean, tell me about burning things and turning it into something charred. I loved it. So simple. 
I mean, it's so, it's completely from personal experience. Um, and again, I forget whether I tell the story in the book, but when I was a chef in Athens, Georgia, I came up with the really not so good idea of making a muscadine grape beef stew. And muscadine grapes have to be like peeled and pitted. They're an absolute disaster um, in, a, in a professional setting. At home, not a big problem. But I totally ran out of time. I turned the heat up way too high in the stew and burned the really singed the bottom of such wonderful local expensive meat and we were buying the most carefully tended you know um beef ever and I couldn't not serve it and I couldn't throw it out and I couldn't you know just put up a closed sign so I put it on the menu as smoked beef stew and got so many compliments and everybody loved it and you know I was like look it is a matter of perspective and if people I was lucky that we were in the South, maybe, where the, you know, the taste of smoke is, um, is really cherished. And there is a, a difference between the taste of like, careful smoke and the taste of scorch. But I was also in a college town, and, and people were told that it would be smoked. And so, you know, expectation is so much a part of, of everything, right? And I, they, they expected smoke, and they got smoke. Um, and, I, and I still I do that all the time, you know? I, I don't think any... Any cook um, pulls things off perfectly. I think a certain amount of kind of confidence and optimism allow you to just change perspective a little bit. Um, and luckily, since this book came out, I mention a Persian um, Persian rice called tadig, which is the has the beautiful crust on the bottom. And since this book came out, um, uh, my friend Samin. Nusrat has has gotten a lot a lot of attention paid to this exact Persian rice dish, and so now people, you know, try to do it on purpose all the time, as as you do in Tadig. But in the book, I talk about, you know, if you burn the bottom of the rice to the rice pot a little bit, you can kind of steam it lightly, and then it comes off, and you can just be like, here's a delicious, beautiful, crusty um, ceiling for the rice, a little dome, and uh, and now people are are doing it. So I think, you know, it's really, it wasn't just a gimmick. It's really true that everywhere, you know, there's always somewhere where the thing that you did by mistake is actually done on purpose. So just pretend that you're there. Yeah, it's brilliant. Confidence and optimism. I love it. Um, It's something that I have very recently taken into dessert making. I have gone through my whole life telling people to bring desserts to dinner. I will make everything else, but desserts I have just left aside. But I'm doing a cookery course with Leith's at the moment. I'm doing six months at Leith's uh, online. It's great fun. And I've just kind of started doing what I'm told. I'm weighing things out. And lo, I can cook desserts. Amazing desserts. Hooray! Your fourth food moment is How to End. Great title. Which is all about desserts. You don't like eating them particularly. But tell us why you love this chapter, so. I love this chapter because, you know, from a purely literary perspective, it's so nice to write about endings. It's so much easier than writing about beginnings. Um, you know, it's, like, it's really hard to start a book, but it's really easy to end a book. And um, I, I, I liked this one so much in particular because I wrote about... Um, the the best dessert I ever had, which was at a restaurant that I've returned to since the book came out um, on the Amalfi Coast. And it was a tiny little super simple restaurant, um, but I was in my early 20s when I went and it was so magical to be, to be there and be young and be, you know, brought these plates of food with no menu. I didn't, it was just the romantic sort of ideal of like they just somebody's just bringing me foods in a language I don't speak in a place I don't recognize and then um our last course which was after dessert was um fresh walnuts and a tiny little glass of red wine and so it was actually a savory um not a sweet ending and I loved the idea of it which I mean it was just such a to have something be so sort of theoretical and also so practically good was um, just really moving and wonderful for me. And the idea was, um, this is like a little bit of a spur toward the next meal, even though you've just had 
you know, this gorgeous long lunch. You end with a little bite of fresh walnut and a little sip of red wine. And it's sort of a, it's like this, you don't, it's, you don't need to eat dinner now. You don't need to eat dinner for, you know, seven hours if you don't want to, but it's a reminder that dinner will come and that it's an opportunity for, for whatever you need it to be. But I was just like, wow, it's so rare that, you know, food can be that sort of, uh, intentionally philosophical, but also really work that well. I don't, I don't like ending stuff on sweet. And so it was so gratifying and just, um, so very much like I want things to always be, you know, and like, you don't have to be full because you can know that there's another, you know, you can be prop, you can be full and you can be satiated, but just the reminder that there will be another meal and another opportunity to sit with people. Um, and I love, I loved writing about that. And I also, there's, it's, I mean, maybe desserts are just so lovely to write about because they have all of these, you know, they have, they have cream and whip and, you know, eggs and beading and copper bowls and just all these like things that are so much fun to write down. Um, so I think it made me really happy to get to write about desserts and, you know, not have to sit there and, and eat them, but then also to write about what I do love, which is like, if everybody just gave me yeah. like a single French fry and a sip of wine or a single nut or a few potato chips, like, you know, I, I, I love that. Like, right. We're going to do this again. I don't have to grip onto this one. How to cook a wolf, an everlasting meal companion book. Somebody says on one of the, the comments, what do you think MFK Fisher would have thought about you? That's a horrifying thing to imagine. I'm, I mean, I always, I always feel like she is simultaneously inspiring me and haunting me. I would hope that we would be friends, but I sometimes try to not open up any book by her while I'm writing something. And then I realize that I really have to have a book by her open when I'm writing anything. Um, I, it's so scary to think of what she would think. I think it's probably best that we're not alive at the same time. She's just a better writer than me. Um, and yeah, I just don't want to know. <laughs> what would she say about the spirit of what you're communicating to a faster world? Oh my God, so much faster. A world where people have forgotten what eating even is about, let alone cooking, where most people can't cook at all, certainly in this country. What would she say about this this mantra of resilience. I mean, I hope she would like want to high five and sit down and drink sherry with me. That would be my hope. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And you can sign up to my newsletter at chillysmith.com and do follow me on Instagram. I'm at foodchillysmith. I'll see you next week.